King in Yellow is a book within Signalis. It appears multiple times throughout the game at vital plot points. The book is inspired by a real-life book of the same name that was written by Robert Chambers. Signalis has many parallels and references to the actual book throughout the course of the game. Hello everyone, Christopher Beast here, and today I will be covering every single thing that King in Yellow can tell us in the lore in one large condensed review video. I've been covering the King of Yellow for about the last 20 odd days. It's been a lot, and it's finally time to review what we found. To put it simply, the King in Yellow is vital to really getting a deeper understanding of the game as a whole. So by delving deeper into it, we can get closer to actually understanding the game and making heads and tails of what is going on in this amazing title. So with no more delay, let's just get right into this. <laughs> Warning, the following video is going to contain a lot of spoilers about Signalis. Proceed at your own risk. If you haven't finished the game yet, I suggest you do so before watching this video. It's much better to get the game's actual experience or a walkthrough of a let's play than having it being spoiled by this video. So to start out, let's review where we see the book throughout the game. The first time we see this tome is in the very beginning of the game, following Elster leaving the Penrose. She descends down a hole and finds another hole, which she crawls through to emerge in what later turns out to be Arion's room. It is within this room that we first find the book. Located on the ledge of a desk, we can interact with it, and must interact with it in order to progress. Doing so, it states, an ancient looking tome is lying on the table. It feels like it's calling to me. At this point, the book will have six seals on it, a detail I'm going to come back to later. Over the course of the game, this number will decrease. Picking it up will cause a cutscene to play, and we'll begin the S23 Serpienti section of the game. The next time we see this tome is in the library within S23's protector layers. After a short puzzle, we free the book from a book storage machine, and upon obtaining the book, again we find it is hollowed out, and within it weighs a piece of the astral lobe. This astral lobe is required to open a box within Nador's room. The astral lobe is also something that is more important in the general lore of the Lovecraftian Chambers-esque universe. On our first visit to the shores of Oblivion is the next time we see it. Before entering nowhere, we are going to find the book in a small niche. The book is just outside of reach, but it can be seen that it has three seals on it. On our return to the shores of Oblivion, which occurs after Elster jumps down the hole in the Penrose after the fake ending, we can again see the book. This time it is in the sea and is going to have two seals on it. Our final time seeing the book during the game is actually at the end of the game when we once again return to Arion's room. This is when we learn that it is Arion's room. The book lays exactly where it did at the start of the game and picking it up lets us leave Arion's room and enter the final part of the game. At this interaction, the book has no more seals left on it. From these general points in which we see the book, we can move to generalized trivia. Generalized lore regarding the book and character interactions with it can start with, really, who read The King in Yellow. Within the lore of Signalis, a small group of important characters are established as having once read or seen this text. Obviously, during the events of the game, Elster opens the book, twice, first at the very beginning of the game, as I just said, when it has seals on it, and again at the end of the game, when it doesn't, which clearly makes her one of these readers. Aside from Elster, it is known that the book was also seen by Erdayan, when it was on display at the Edo bookstore, before it was confiscated by the nation. Arion also saw it again in a dream while on the Penrose. In this dream, Arion remembers her mother once taking notes from the King in Yellow. However, seeing as this is a dream, we don't know for sure if her mother actually read it. One of the two Edos also interacted with the book. Arion does not remember exactly which one, meaning it could be either Issa or Erica, but they interacted it during the time it was in their store. The next thing to note is the appearance of the book in-game. The appearance of the book in-game is a clear reference to the cover of the actual book. However, it does sport some differences. Most notably is the change of the back cover, from a stylized backing to a tesseract-ritual design, and the addition of the three stars. These three stars are usually going to be connected with either the nation or by a resonance. On top of these design changes, there are also the addition of seals on the book. The seals are going to be clearly the plates from nowhere, and over the course of the game, these seals are going to slowly fall off. One last thing. The book is considered a banned book by the nation, and upon discovering its presence, it was confiscated from the Edos by the nation. From here, in general lore, we can move to connections and possible powers. 
the Canyon Yellow connects to many locations and pieces of lore, as well as generalized ideas across Signalis. These connections establish as something having great lore significance. There's also a deeper theory that paints the Canyon Yellow as having power itself. This section will cover the connections as well as the deeper theory that relates to them. Starting off, we got bioresonance. The Canyon Yellow holds some level of power. What the exact limits of this power are does depend on theory. Considering the king's power in its respective lore, the book can distort its readers. This influence of the reader is similar in many ways to how bioresonance can influence minds and emotions of others, meaning that the book itself may hold bioresonant powers. As aforementioned stated, the king in yellow has a halo and three stars on it. These are symbols heavily connected to bioresonance. But it should be noted that the origin of the three diamond symbol for bioresonance is currently unknown, as it's likely not a natural occurrence. The reason that this is stated is that we do not see those three diamonds on Arianne, and if it was on Arianne, then they would have known that she was bioresonant, but because it doesn't appear on her, it must mean that the symbol is something the nation puts on people. It is possible that the source for this symbol was the King in Yellow itself, seeing as this book predates any other possible known origin point for the symbol. If this is the case, it means the Empire likely knew of the King in Yellow and understood it as a bioresonant being and it means that the Empire, which worshipped Bioresonance, decided to use a symbol from the King in Yellow to represent the group that they worshipped. It is also theorized that due to the book's ability to manipulate the reader in most depictions of it, this ability may have carried over to Signalis. If this is the case, then if a Bioresonant individual crossed path with the book, the chances are they would be easily influenced by the book, and would be able to cause distortions in reality due to the corruption of their own mind being made manifest by the book. It is also theorized that its powers go far beyond just influencing the reader, but also being able to influence reality itself, or that the King in Yellow is a bioresonant being in itself. That should be considered at least, in part, responsible for the events of the game. Granted, if he was manifested, it should be noted that he would not be human, but rather just a being of immense power, not exactly like a normal character-looking thing. On this note, we can move over to the Flesh Below Lang. The Flesh Below Wang refers to nowhere from a lore perspective. This location is greatly connected to the King in Yellow, and this connection is due to the plates appearing both in Nowhere and on the book, and also due to deeper theories regarding the book holding actual power and the manifestations of that power being connected to Nowhere. Their first large connection is distortion of reality. Anyone who's played through Nowhere knows that Nowhere is a very distorted space, with self-referential nonsense doors, as well as just general wrong geography. The King in Yellow is established within its own canon as being beyond reality, a fourth dimensional creature beyond comprehension who is able to corrupt the minds of men as well as distort reality itself. If it holds the ability to distort reality, then the greatly distorted area of Nowhere, where doors are nonsensical as I already stated, and heavy decay, could be assumed to be connected. There is a deeper theory here, that due to these many connections between the King and Nowhere, and with it being the location of the plates, as well as it being a location certainly within the realm of his creation, there are some who theorize that the King in Yellow and the Flesh Below are the same being. Even if they aren't the same being though, it should be noted that they are deeply connected. With the King and the Flesh being connected, the King is by extension also connected to the Empress, since the Flesh is. There is another connection between these two, albeit far weaker connection, and that is that the symbol of the ritual and the symbol of the empire are both centered around a hexagon, with the empire having a rotating hexagon that grows, while the ritual is a 2D diagram of a tesseract. If it is believed that the empire knew of the king in yellow, and since they worship by resident individuals, they most likely held the king in high regard. We do also know that there is a possibility that the empress could have used the king herself. This would make sense considering how powerful she was and how the King in Yellow is connected to the other very powerful bioresonant in the lore, that being Arianne. There is another pocket theory here. It has been theorized that nowhere is a lost test site for the Empire. This is based off the warning for nuclear waste found at the start of nowhere. The Empire could have been experimenting on how to contain the flesh from spreading airborne, with the Empire eventually figuring out how to contain it using the seals possibly using the flesh within to create the replicas, due to the fact that the replicas feature a mostly black color scheme, and that the replicas that lack this mostly black color scheme seem to be less stable. It also should be noted that we do know replicas were created using bioresonance, 
and that if the Empire, and by extension the King in Yellow, are both heavily connected to bioresonance, it is possible that the Empire just used the King in Yellow. However, that is deep in theory. Moving a bit out of theory, we can get into plates and seals. The seals, or the plates, are both found throughout nowhere, and they're also found being the seals that hold the King in Yellow, closed or sealed. These seem to be made out of basalt rocks mined in the mines, with parts of the flesh from below within it. However, investigating the plates states they are made out of marble, maybe suggesting that the rocks within the mines are some type of basalt marble fusion. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not a good geologist. So starting off, let's focus on the plates within nowhere. Each plate within nowhere required an action from Elster in order to obtain. Most of these actions either required something related to the name of the plate, or can be used to assume details about the methodology which we acquired it. The plate of knowledge was obtained using the rings on the empress. Due to the nature of this puzzle giving us insight into the life of this figure, it can be seen that this knowledge is the knowledge we learned for the plate. This plate also connects the flesh to the empress. Seeing how this knowledge is important enough to be called the plate of knowledge, it can be used to assume that the flesh itself, and by extension the king, wanted Elster to learn about the Empress's fate. This also creates a counter-argument to dream theory, and while that's not something I'm going to really focus on in this video, I wanted to quickly mention it. Dream theory would suggest that either Falcon, Arion, or Issa are the ones that are creating the dream. However, none of them would have any real care about what happened to the Empress, and due to the nature of living under the nation, I doubt they would know anything about the rule or the end of the rule. But it is un also unknown why the Flesh or King would want Elster to know about her rule, as of this moment. The Plate of Love was obtained after lighting an incense at the altar for the Young family. Seeing how Elster loves Arianne Young is to be understood to be representative of that. The Plate of Balance was obtained after using the dolls to balance a scale, so quite literal in the sense of balance. The Plate of Eternity was obtained after opening the Magpie Box early into the game, it takes us to the radio station. The exact connection with the name is currently not known, but this traveling to the radio station holds some level of importance. As if we are physically sent to the station, then the use of bioresonance to bend space and possibly time, as well as you know using the plate in order for us to access the radio module, it, it kind of creates a sense of eternity. It should also be added that upon accessing the plate, a short cutscene plays where we see a large beating heart, as well as the plate puzzle within nowhere, this can be interpreted as us communicating with the flesh, and perhaps it was the flesh's desire that we gained the ability to go deeper towards it, with it using its powers to send us to this location to gather this tool. Or perhaps this is symbolic of it calling to us and us being tempted by its call to go deeper, and in that way is showing eternity by us continuing the cycle and continuing to answer its call. The Plate of Flesh is the next one, and this was obtained after completing the maze, this can be seen as a symbolic gesture of nowhere as a whole, a giant maze, which in the code is actually known as the labyrinth. The plate of sacrifice is found in the second maze within nowhere. Its meaning can be seen as similar to the meaning of the plate of flesh, meaning its exact meaning is currently unknown. The plates can also be seen as depicted on the TVs within the code room in nowhere, um, and the meaning of that could be seen as the plates are connected in some way to the doors that we unlock, but how exactly is also currently unknown. Another major thing to do with the seals and the plates is the ones on the King in Yellow. Due to the ordeals connected with each of the plates within nowhere, they can be seen as a trial that must be surmounted in order to prove oneself, and much like the trials within nowhere, these trials must also occur on the seals of the King in Yellow and perhaps suggesting that one must prove themselves in order for the king in yellow to be undone. So, if we assume all that to be true, then we can begin to theorize about the various trials Elster went through to cause the seals on the king in yellow to fall off. One methodology we can use to try and understand exactly what trials were what is data mining. Because using data mining, we can find which seals are on the book during the two gestades. It is by using this that we learn that prior to the first gestade, love, eternity, and flesh were removed. Between first and second gestade, sacrifice was removed. And between second gestade and the end of the game, balance and knowledge were removed. Using this, we can theorize about what caused the removal of each of these seals. Love can be seen as the first seal that breaks based off this data mine knowledge. This seal would break due to Elsa deciding to go on an adventure of love and search for her lost lover. Granted, at the start of the game, she may not remember her lover's identity, but she's still going on this quest in the name of love and due to loving someone. If 
we need a specific moment for which the seal would be destroyed, it could be seen as her refusing to leave the facility after the star unit tells her to. This is her choosing love and continuing the adventure, rather than choosing herself and running away, despite the fact that someone told her directly to do so. Eternity can be seen as the second seal that breaks based off this knowledge. This one would break when one acquires the Eternity plate in the butterfly box. Upon acquiring the plate, we remove the seal from the book. It breaks not just due to the physical acquirement of the seal, but also due to Elser's interaction with the bioresonance and the distortion that is caused in the cycles. By interacting with these, she is noticing the Eternity and continuing to spite them. A second possible moment could be seen as the point at which Eternity was broken. This can be, specifically, her surviving the elevator shaft, as in all prior Eternities, she dies after hitting the bottom. Flesh is a difficult one to theorize about, however it can be seen as either the moment Elster falls down the elevator shaft, symbolized by her falling on her own flesh in order to progress and continue through, or it can be seen as being unlocked at the beginning of the game with the Yules cutting up flesh, and Elster traversing these flesh-infested halls of personnel. The assumption should be that whatever room didn't cause Eternity to unlock likely had flesh unlock in close proximity. So if Eternity was unlocked by falling at the bottom of the elevator, then flesh likely wasn't unlocked there and likely was unlocked by the Yule, and vice versa. From there, we have Sacrifice. This seal is unlocked between first and second estate, meaning unlocked somewhere during either Nowhere, the Fate Ending, or Memory. This is a very eventful period of the game. However, the only thing that really resembles the sacrifice of Elsters would be her decision to take the armor and arm of the prior Elster. By doing this, her past, or future depending on how you look at it, self-sacrificed her parts in order to help continue the journey, and pursue the promise. Perhaps the sacrifice could be viewed as this prior Elster's failures to end the cycle, or even our Elster's opening half of the hatch be able to create a situation where the journey could actually be completed. From here, we have the final part of the game and the final two seals. Following second estate, we really only have Corrupted Ed, Re-Edge, and Rot Front, which close out the game. Balance would have to be unlocked during this part of the game, however, how exactly it is is still not clearly defined in theory. One possibility is the restoration of balance by the death of Issa. By someone who died long ago, returning to the state of death, it represents a restoration of balance. This can be further supported by the fact she was the one who did a ritual, and by her passing, her influence on the ritual, and the space in general, has weakened, granting Elster greater control. My main issue with this theory, though, is it suggests that one of the plates is broken by an action that is out of Elster's control, and I just don't think that's very likely. Knowledge is likely to have been unlocked last. The exact circumstances for which could vary, as Rotfront is a part of the game that has several large plot developments. One option could be learning of Issa's fate. Learning the truth of what happened to our friend is one type of knowledge. However, seeing as it doesn't pertain to our adventure, I again find that not very likely. Another option is the completion of the Moldenkind puzzle, which is a moment of knowledge. By reading the Dream Reader's Diary and gathering the Sixth Tarot, which causes us to read several notes and explore all of Rot Front, we gain the most amount of knowledge that is possible to prepare Elster for the final act. However, this solution required information from data mining, which Yuri has stated is not to be used in any way to shape our understanding or lore of the game. Due to this, really any combination of points across the game can be used to connotate the removal of the seals works as long as it follows what normal gameplay states. I just chose to use the data mined option because if anything works, might as well just make something that works with what is data mined. So why is the king in yellow sealed? The book we see in the game is sealed by the seals, but the reason why it's sealed is never told to us nor indirectly referenced by any notes, weaving in a realm of pretty much pure theory. One concept is that the book is sealed by an external power, with some ragering that it was the Grand Empress who sealed the book, and that is why the flesh pertains her grave to us. This would also connect to the Empire's heavy connections to the book, as well as the fact that the Empress was very powerful during her life, so it's definitely someone who could have sealed the King of Yellow. Another possible theory, though, is that the book is sealed by right of usage, as in, Alster is not fit to use the book until she has completed its various tasks. This could be her needing to gain more control over herself and her brain in order to harness its full power, but I think that's unlikely. In The King in Yellow, most of its readers are driven mad by the book, so perhaps the trials are a testament to how engrossed she is in the character role she's ascribing to herself. 
that being of the original Elster 512, which, spoiler warning, she is not. So why these seals? The seals that Elster has to break of knowledge, love, balance, eternity, flesh, and sacrifice represent important milestones of her journey. However, from a lore perspective, why these seals are chosen is unknown and currently left to theory. One possible theory to explain this from a lore perspective is that it represents fully becoming the character that you are representing from the play, The King in Yellow. Love, sharing of their passions and desires. Flesh, sharing of their physical traits. Sacrifice, willing to lose everything in the name of becoming akin to them. Eternity, willing to hold that status into the future or forever. Balance, finding peace as this new character and fully embracing your role as them. Knowledge, knowing the nature of your change and still embracing it or knowing how to be your character. Granted, this is a rough idea and further theorization is going to be needed to cement ideas in this regard. Connections to the keys. There are three keys required for the secret Lily ending, and those three keys hold the same names as specific seals on the king in yellow, those being love, sacrifice, and eternity. These three keys are theorized as going even further than just breaking the seal, but rather hyper-focusing on those attributes and channeling them through the king to materialize something new. The depiction of the ritual in the book also suggests that the book is what teaches one how to do the ritual, a concept that is backed by the fact that only readers of the book have done the ritual. So with those two things combined, it really does seem like the Lily ending is something that's only possible to people who truly understand the king in yellow and are doing it through his power. Next, the shores of oblivion. The shores of oblivion have heavy connection to the king in yellow, being the location where we encounter the book twice. However, there are other connections aside from just this. The first connection can be seen upon our first visit to the estate. When we emerge from the cave at the start of that, we can see that the cave takes a shape similar to that of the Hooded King. And for those who don't know, the Hooded King and the King in Yellow are the same person. The next thing is the presence of the notes that are on this first estate. These are mostly quotes from the King in Yellow, either the book, the play, or from a perspective of someone like the King in Yellow. And they pretty much solidly connect estate to the King. These notes state as follows. These notes have uh, corrupted aspects. For those, I'm just going to state that it's corrupted. There is a working way to decode these, but for the sake of simplicity for this video, I will not. For there be different sorts of death. Some wherein the body remains corrupted, some it vanished quite away with spirit. One kind of death the spirit dies corrupted, while yet the body was in vigor for many years. Sometimes corrupted, it dieth with the body, but corrupted is raised up again, corrupted, where the body did decay. And a corrupted star fell, corrupted sky. And a mountain fell into the sea. And corrupted turned to blood. Corrupted moon, corrupted, turned dark. Along the shore the cloud waves break. The twin suns sink, corrupted, the shadows lengthen. Corrupted, the night where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still. Song of corrupted and sun, as tears unshed shall dry and die. In the night where black stars rise note, the sentence ends at stranger still. However, this is a line from the yellow sign or king in yellow, which ends with, but stranger still is lost Carcosa. So while we're talking about quotes that are from the king in yellow, we might as well just start talking about connections to the actual book. The king in yellow, as I've aforementioned, is a real book written by Robert Chambers. This book details a series of stories that connect to the mythical book which shares the same name. This mythical book within has a play within its pages that can cause some sorts of distortion and otherworldly events. The game features illusions and details from both the real book and the mythical tome. The first note we can look at is becoming a character. One of the concepts within The King in Yellow is that characters who read it will find themselves adopting attributes from a character within the text. This can be cited primarily in the Repair of Reputation story, where Hildred Cassinier, a young man in the futuristic New York City, comes across the mythical tome and reads it. Upon reading it, he loses his sanity and ascribes himself upon the role of the heir of the Imperial Dynasty of America. It can also be seen in The Mask, where the main character believes himself akin to the Pallet Mask. In Signalis, there are many examples of characters adopting attributes, knowledge, or even blending with other characters. One such primary example can be seen with Alena, Ariane, and Falk. This trio all recounts being overwritten in some degree by Ariane, with them all sitting over the course of the game, slowly turning into the Penrose officer in some way. 
with Folk stating that Arion had invaded her mind, and Elena stating she is slowly losing herself to Arion. Another weaker example can be seen between Elster and Issa. These two seem to exchange memories, as can be seen in the flashback to the school in Rotfront, and seem to be traveling down the same path. However, the connection is not as strong as the previous example, and could just be an example of a parallel character in literary events, which wouldn't exactly suggest the King Yellow. Seeing how the King Yellow in its canon possesses the ability to distort people into a role within its story, it is very possible that such an occurrence is occurring within Signalis' universe. I wear no mask. This quote by Adler right before the final act of the game is a direct quote from the mythical King in Yellow. It is quoted in the mask as being from Act 1, Scene 2 of the play. The quote is said by the Powered Mask, a mysterious character also known as the Stranger. They are seen as an Emissary 4, an Avatar 4, or the King in Yellow himself. It really depends and that's what I was able to get from reading a lot of different papers on what how people interpret Chambers work. This character arrives before Casadil and is asked to unmask. However, they state they wear no mask and they refuse to remove the mask. Connecting Adler to this character, we can see Adler in multiple ways. The simplest would be to connect to the fact that he is in fact corrupted at this point and wearing a physical mask of flesh following his corruption. Him stating he wears no mask would be as to say he rejects accepting that he too has fallen to the distortion that took his beloved folk and would be more so representative of him saying that this is a true self, or that he just never fell, and that he thinks he's still sane. This can be added to say that at this point in the story, as a corrupted individual, he could be acting as the king would see fit, seeing as the connection to the stranger would paint him as someone loyal to the king in the distortion, meaning he desires what the distortion or king does, which is kind of important when we think about Adwar as a character in the final act. If he is someone who has fallen to the distortion, and he's acting in a way that either the king sees fit or the distortion sees fit, I don't exactly think we can take any quotes from him in the final act of the game as being in the best interest of either Adler or anyone aside from the distortion. The Powered Mask also holds connection to Alec, the protagonist of the mask. If we instead choose to focus on this connection, we can paint Adler as someone who has succumbed to the insanity caused by the distortion and the king, and can begin to draw parallels between their two stories. In the mask, Alec loves Genevieve, however, she instead loves his friend Boris more. However, this seems to change when one day Alec and Genevieve read from the King in Yellow, following which she declares her love for him, despite past refusals to do such a thing and, as I said, really more so loving Boris instead. The pair rapidly then descend into insanity. She, ultimately in her fit of mania, decides to leap into a pool made of liquid that turns living beings into marble. This liquid was produced by Boris, who studied the King in Yellow in order to create it. If we connect this to Adler's story, we can find some similarities. Adler loves Falk, but she loves Arion. However, unlike in the story, Falk falls in love with Arion due to the book, rather than in love with him. However, akin to the story, she is ultimately consumed by the media, and again, contrary to the story, dies in a way, becoming a distorted creature that Elster kills. It seems as though Adler is honestly more akin to the pallid mask than Alec, which ultimately spells out tragedy for him because Alec's story ends out positive, with Alec finally being reunited with his lover at the end, while the pallid mask story is he's just an emissary of a fourth dimensional demon thing. Moving from here, we can look at the powers of bioresonance and how this connects to the story. The powers of bioresonance are vast and seemingly have no clear limit, However, comparing the known powers of this ability to the known powers of the King in Yellow in its canon, we can find some heavy connections. Bioresonance can influence the minds of others. The King in Yellow can influence the minds of others either by ascribing characters or by driving people insane. Bioresonance can be used to telepathically communicate with others. The King in Yellow can grant its readers telepathia. This is shown by Tessie in the Yellow Sign when she telepathically communicates with her lover, Jack. Bioresonance can be used to distort reality. The King in Yellow detail within the play holds cosmic powers that can cause apocalyptic tier events, of which include distortion of reality. Finally, the last thing to connect with the actual book, we have the Calibri's Corrupted Text. Within the Calibri's Corrupted Text lies the following quote, which is a direct reference to the King in Yellow story. Strange is the night where dark stars rise, and strange moons circling through the sky. Songs that the hides should sing where the king's rags blow. Must die unheard, songs of my soul, my voice is dead. 
You die, unsung, like tears when shed. This is a direct quote from Casadale's song, which removes the references to Carcosa that would usually be at the bottom of each verse. This heavily connects the distortion of the Calibris to the King in Yellow, which, in turn, connects the distortion of the facility as a whole to him. With that, we have covered everything we currently know regarding the King in Yellow and the things that are connected to him. With this, we are far further into understanding the game as a whole. We can actually begin knocking out the more complicated topics using the King in Yellow to help us. So hopefully you are as excited for that as I am. If you'd like to talk to other Signalis fans about the lore, just in general, in my description I have my main Discord, VSL, linked below. It is where I'll be discussing theories and lore regarding the rest of the game as we begin to march forward, so hopefully some of y'all swing over. Finally, once again, thank you to Mr. Stelly for supporting my membership. Your contributions help make this series possible. And thank you to everybody who watched and listened and enjoyed the King and Yellow series. It was really fun and nice to be able to finally get some solid concrete answers regarding Signalis' lore. And I'm hopeful that using this as a springboard, we can begin to actually understand the entire game. So with that, this has been Christopher Beast, and I hope to see you all well next time.